response time. Welcome to the Square Circle. I'm your host, Adam Byrne. Joining us today are Leif Larson of Craft DC, political correspondent for McClatchy, James Rosen, and Kelly Vlahos of the American Conservative. Welcome, everyone. Good to be here. Possible ties between the Trump campaign and the Kremlin were again in the spotlight this week. Here's FBI Director James Comey testifying to Congress. I have been authorized by the Department of Justice to confirm that the FBI, as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. And that includes investigating the nature of any links between individuals associated with the Trump campaign and the Russian government, and whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russia's efforts. Later in the week, the Associated Press reported that former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort had business dealings with Moscow as late as 2009. So, James Rosen, lots of smoke. Is there any fire? I think there is fire. I, um, I'm going to take a go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that I, I believe that President Trump uh, will not survive this scandal. I, I think it's. Um, I think if you compare it to where the Watergate scandal was at a similar point. It's actually a bigger scandal. And one, one of the things that we've seen is that, forget about the drip, drip, drip. It's a, it's a flood, flood, flood. And um, these latest revelations are, are absolutely stunning. You have, you have intelligence officials um, uh, telling reporters that there was collusion, collusion, active collusion between s senior Trump um, uh, campaign aides and Russian uh, spies, Russian intelligence officials. Now, they may not have known they were Russian spies, but if any of that, if any of that, I, I think one of the things that's going on here is that President Trump really angered the intelligence community. And I think that uh, he embarrassed, he tried to embarrass them. He ridiculed them. He's done it repeatedly. He did it in his campaign. He's done it since he became president. And I think he, he quite frankly, has made enemies. I think he's made enemies at the CIA. I think he's made enemies at the FBI. I don't think it's a question of liberals versus conservatives, because I, in my experience, most of the intelligence folks are conservative. They're not liberal. There are some liberals. But uh, I, think he, I think this is payback time. And I think that they are, I think there are people within the intelligence community who want to end his presidency. And I, think, and I think partly they think he's a loose cannon. I think they think he's dangerous. And it's not just that they're angry at him. I think, I think they think they're doing this for the good of the country. So again, to compare it to Watergate, um, this, is, this, is potentially a, this is potentially a bigger scandal. Now, the latest report also that Manafort, who uh, Mr. Spicer has been put in an impossible, uh, the, the White House, the White House press, press Secretary, he's been put in an impossible position of defending the indefensible. Um, and, you know, he's not the first White House press secretary to be put in that position, but he's really in that position. He was put in a position where he had to say his best argument was that Mr. Manafort didn't, I can't remember if he said, he said he had a minor role, I believe, or not a major role in the campaign. Mr. Manafort was chairman of the campaign for six months. So, so, so it's a ludicrous statement on the face of it. But, but they don't have a better hand to play. That's the problem. And if you, don't, if you have such bad hands to play this early in a major scandal like this that you have to make uh, statements that, it, like one reporter shouted, was so, it, it, shouted out as soon as he said it. He, was, he ran the campaign for six months. What are you talking about? That if you have to say, if you have to make uh, ludicrous statements that are outright lies on the face of it as your only defense, you're, you're in trouble. And, these, and very quickly, these latest, uh, these latest uh, revelations that AP, I think, is reporting about Mr. Manafort and how closely he worked with uh, billionaire oligarchs, extremely close with Mr. Putin to help Mr. Putin's government. If that's proven to be true, it, it's, it's just that I don't think that Mr. Trump can, uh, President Trump can, can, can um, withstand a lot of these 
uh, more of these sorts of allegations. Kelly Vlaho, is it payback time? Well, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know exactly where I want to start with this, um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> fantasy land would be a good place, maybe. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I do think um, I, I do think there's a lot of smoke there, but I have yet to see fire, and I want to see some conclusive evidence that there was collusion, and if there was collusion, to what ends? No one has been able. To it it took a year and a half yet. for conclusive evidence to come out in Watergate. Okay, okay? so when it's going to take a lot less time for conclusive. So when evidence you say conclusive uh, evidence and collusion, what do you mean? Collusion to what ends? To um, to manipulate the election? To, oh, absolutely. Um, and, and I think it, they worked on the. I think they worked on the WikiLeaks stuff together. I think they but worked. But you on don't the, have any proof. No, I don't and have American proof. people right, do not exactly. have any proof, proof of that. Yes. No, I, no, I and I don't mind waiting. No, but there's until an, that comes. But there's an intel. Wait, wait a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. There is an intelligence investigation going on. That's been going okay. on right. for six months. Okay, it's that's been going on for six months, and I think the single most outrageous fact, outrageous. It's it's beyond belief to me as a political reporter, that FBI Director Comey would publicly say in the summertime and then right before the election, he would talk about the investigation into Hillary's emails, but he did not mention an ongoing investigation know, that, about Trump that was much that more Democrats serious. Like Leif Larson, I can see time. you're desperate to get in here. Uh, the only thing I will agree with on, on, on any of that is, is the fact that, yes, I think this is retribution from the intelligent community, which is proof of what we have all feared. There is a deep state at work here, and you, you, you said it. These are intelligence community people who have decided they're going to violate the law by unmasking American citizens who were caught in conversations with diplomats, which happens all the time, but the law says you must keep their name secret. There's about 20 people in the government yeah. who have permission to unmask those names. I think, I think who's going to go to jail, you're going to find Obama administration people when it comes out, who gave permission to have those names unmasked that showed... Flynn was in conversations that showed that, you know, Manafort or, uh, you know, I forget the other name of the gentleman who, who worked with, with, with Paul in, in, you know, over the past, but those people that were caught in conversations with Russians, who gave permission for that to be unmasked to let the leaks go out? Okay. The only thing we know for sure is people leaked information illegally. If Deep that Throat, has caused, had, not, that if has Deep caused, Throat had not leaked Watergate, the, the Watergate, Woodward and Bernstein would never what, have gotten Watergate was out. a criminal break-in. This wasn't wiretapping of... of uh, oh, this uh, is much worse than a criminal break-in. No, no, it, no, I'll agree with you, because these people committed treason that leaked. They committed treason. You could have said that about Deep Throat. No, you couldn't. He was committed... He, he was, he, this, was a, this was not wiretapping that he was coming forward with. Whoever Deep Throat was... Oh, did they ever find out? Yeah, they did. It was it, yeah, uh, it wasn't Al Hag. I, I can't yeah, remember. Whoever it was. Yeah, that, Anyways, I the... Uh, um, you know, I, I, I think what we're going to find out is, is Obama people gave permission to erase these names in order to have them leaked out, in order to embarrass the president. And I think you're right. This is the deep state intelligence community angry that their position has been uh, marginalized by Trump, have, that he's ridiculed them. And I think, I think that's the story. I don't think the story is, uh, you know, like you said, there's a lot of smoke. Um, I think it was a former uh, Obama <laughs> uh, uh, deputy director at the CIA said there's a lot of smoke, but there's not even a campfire. There's not even a match uh, I did, to I, light the campfire. Okay, I so, so the, the House Intelligence Committee have been looking into this along with the Senate. Their chairman, Devin Nunes, and the House Committee under fire for sharing some of this information with the White House and the press before talking to his committee about it. Kelly, do you think there should be a special committee to look into this? I really don't know. I mean, I'd like to let the investigation take its course now, but looking at how these investigations have uh, rolled out in the past, like take Benghazi, for example, they are over-politicized. We saw the Whitewater investigation, for example, during the Clinton years go on for, for years. Monica Lewinsky, I don't know if our government and our system can withstand another eight-year investigation. Okay. We have well, so much more to do. And Hopefully we'll see some facts soon. But yeah, yeah. For, hopefully some facts. It won't take eight years. <coughs> but it for now, I'd, I'd like to remind our Never viewers <laughs> that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air towards the end of the show.
So late this afternoon, the Republican leadership in the House of Representatives decided to delay the vote on the GOP's health care bill until Friday. It's an obvious setback for the bill, and it's unclear if enough Republicans will eventually support it. So Leif Larson, President Trump, came into office touting his negotiating skills. Mm -hmm. Why can't he get this bill across the line? Well, I think this, this is the first, the first sign of what Trump really is. He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's a populist. What we have is we have very, very conservative, a block of about 40 Republican Congress members who are in districts that they win with 65, 75 percent of the vote every year. They're never going to lose. Um, and so what they're taking is a position that they say their, their constituents want, but I doubt, which is they want complete disinvolvement of the government completely from insurance, let the, sh the, the, the uh, capitalist system run it all the way, uh, get rid of cost raising things like, you know, uh, uh, having, um, uh, you know, uh, pre-existing medical benefits that block people or, or, you know, making people pick up, making insurance companies give people insurance that have pre-existing uh, uh, conditions. They want that all removed and let the, sit, let the capitalistic system run its course. Who cares if we have 24, 30, 50, 60 million people uninsured? That's, that, 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 that's a complete non-starter, but that's what they want. And how, we get, how he wins them over will be interesting to see. I think he's got the power of the presidency. He has a very strong, still, a populist appeal. And I think if he goes to these members' districts and, and gets up there and says, these people are selling you out. They've just ruined the Republican Party. I was repealing Obamacare, and they stopped it. You need to get a new person, and here's the person that I want running my, for your new Congress member. That may start to get some of these people who don't get 75, may they get 60, and they don't want to see it drop below that. Um, but it's going to be a tough sell. This was a tough sell, and you know, from from the get go, uh, you know, I think I think the only thing that the Freedom Caucus has helped is the Democratic Party so far. <laughs> Kelly, you were nodding your head there. You think that's how President yeah, Trump's going to Yeah, I mean, I I'll take a riff off of what Jim had said. I I think that this is something that maybe Trump won't politically survive. Um, I don't think they're going to get the vote, and I think that he has staked his. Uh, political success as a deal maker and I think that he allowed the uh, House Republicans to come forward with um, an unmanageable and um, very unpopular uh, piece of legislation here that they can't get the votes on. Um, the majority of Americans don't like Obamacare, we can all agree on that, but they don't like it because it's unaffordable. Because they may have access to health care but they can't afford the health care and it decimated a lot of personal budgets over the last few years. And what this bill doesn't do is fix that. And so I think even his Republican base is looking at Washington right now and saying, well, how are you fixing? What are you replacing this with? And he's unable to get the votes and he's been trying to horse trade all day with this Freedom Caucus by giving them goodies. And then the, re the, the moderate Republicans are looking at it and going, well, this is becoming even more unpalatable for me in my district. So that is why they delayed the vote. And I think that if American people are looking at Trump the deal maker and they're saying that he can't make the deal, um, this is this is not good. He, he might end up blaming Paul Ryan and oh, the Republicans that, that, for this. There's a bus always ready to have somebody thrown under in so Washington. Exactly. If the Republicans can't agree, will there be health care reform at all? I think um, we're seeing uh, the best and the worst of Donald Trump right now on, in health care. I think he's, he's doing something, uh, to, to his credit, uh, that President Obama really never did, which is he is, he, one by one, he is going to the members of uh, Congress in his party, both the moderates on one side and the, the Freedom Caucus folks, the conser ultra-conservatives on the other side, and he's trying to persuade them to vote for him. And he's letting them know, he's letting them know, he joked with Mark Meadows of the Freedom Caucus, right, Freedom Caucus, mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. He ostensibly was joking, but if you know Donald Trump, he really wasn't joking. He said, Mark, I'm coming after you. If you, if you don't, if you don't support this bill, and so he's he's trying to put the fear of God into into these folks, as Kelly was saying, he's you know, but he's but he's 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 doing what uh, Pre what President Johnson did famously, which was go going to these members of Congress, twisting their arms, cajoling, and so forth. The bad side of it is, is so I you know I give him props for that. I mean, this is a major piece of legislation. Whatever you think of. The legislation. If the president puts his name behind it, this is really what he should do, and it's it's one thing that President Obama was not willing to do. On the other hand, 
Um, Lyndon Johnson, having been Senate Majority Leader, and understanding the process from the inside out, right. Lyndon, and, and understanding the appropriations process, and just just a master, you know, he, he could really make deals because he had he had stuff to give these folks. He understood what they needed. He understood what they wanted. He could make trades with them, horse trades with them. President Trump has nothing to give these folks. He doesn't have the he doesn't have the power that Lyndon Johnson had. He doesn't have the knowledge that he Lyndon doesn't Johnson have the had. Ratings. He doesn't he doesn't have the allies. Lyndon Johnson had allies sure. who could deliver. So Donald Trump can't give these folks anything in return to their for their votes. So the well, Republicans finally have control of all three, or of the the House of Congress and the White House. Mm -hmm. How concerned are you that? Given that this control, they can't seem to agree on what they have said would be for the last seven or eight years their well, I mean, their main goal. I, 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 I think it's we're seeing what the Republican Party has been for the last right. fifteen years, which is a circular firing squad. Right. You know, once you're in, once they're in control, they 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 proceed to like kill each other off real quick. Um, <clears throat> what I will, what I who I will say, if if this does does not pass and does not go to a vote on Friday, there are there are. Two winners and one. There's one winner and two two losers. The the two losers will be uh, Speaker Ryan and Reince Priebus because he was supposed to be the inside person that knew how this played. Uh, Bannon will be the winner because he will say, "I told you so. These guys will not work with you. Right. Get rid of them." So there's a rift. We'll see how it goes. But our final topic tonight is on President Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch, who was in front of Congress for the first time this week. Democrats asked tough questions, and today they said that they would aim to filibuster his nomination. So, Kelly Vlahos, will we see Judge Gorsuch take a seat on the Supreme Court? Well, I'm sure eventually they will, and I think that the Democrats, from what I've been reading this morning, are, are looking for their deal, and they're looking to get some things out of this before, before it's over. Um, yeah, Schumer, uh, Senator Schumer had announced that he will lead an opposition uh, to Neil Gorsuch, um, just you know, um, just a little background. I mean, Neil Gorsuch had given two days of almost flawless testimony um, before the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, there, the Democrats are are poking at his conservative record, um, his conservative record, um, which would be on the Hobby Lobby and you know religious freedom. Um, there was a case yesterday. The Supreme Court had had sided with a family who wanted um, stronger, um, better standards for their disabled child um, in, in school. They wanted public schools to um, sort of endeavor to give um, a better, better education to disable their disabled, challenged um, children under the Disabilities Act. Gorsuch, as a justice on the Tenth Circuit um, in 2008, had voted that had had ruled that um, states only have to give like the minimum education requirements to disabled children under the Disabilities Act. So they, the Democrats attacked him on this. He actually apologized for that, saying that he was following precedence at the time. So they were trying to poke holes in his testimony. Um, but, and, you know, as far as these things go, they were relatively non-controversial hearings, and he came off as, as a very a constitutional, uh, uh, constructionist. He, he he didn't come off as overly ideological. So it, it remains to be seen on, on what kind of deals can be made to get him through. Yeah, and there was no real gotcha moments in these hearings. So do the Democrats really have concerns over Judge Gorsuch, or is this payback for the Republicans blocking Merrick Garland as President oh, I Obama's think, nominee? I, I think definitely some payback going on, for sure. No doubt about that. But I think the problem is, is that... Um, is that if the, the the difference is that um, the Republicans controlled the Senate and so they could they they were in a position to prevent Garland from being considered. The Democrats don't control the Senate; they're not in a position to protect Gorsuch from being considered. So they don't have the power. And my feeling is, if you can't if you can't bring a, a Supreme Court nominees are a separate kettle of fish. They're different than anything else on Capitol Hill. If you can't bring down, if you can't, you know, like Bork, okay. If you if you don't have the goods to bring somebody down, uh, I I think you should only protest so long and so much. And I think the Democrats risk overplaying their hand. 
and just being seen as what they accuse the Republicans of being often, which is obstructionist. And, and so I, I think protesting, asking tough questions at a hearing, nothing wrong with that. That's what the Senate's for. But, if, you know, sh filibustering toward what end? Well, the Democrats will argue that President, the Supreme Court nominees for President Obama, who made it to the court, received at least 60 votes. George W. Bush's nominees received at least 60 votes. So why shouldn't Judge Gorsuch? It's not in the rules. <laughs> you know, I, the, the, the thing is, there, there, this could be one of two things. Number one, the hearings did go very well um, for him, and they didn't get a gotcha. And Schumer has to balance out the Warrens and those type of people in his, in his, uh, his side of the aisle. And so this may be kabuki theater. He may have cut a deal with McConnell. Let my people, mm. we're going to filibuster tomorrow. We're going to uh, filibuster on Monday. Um, and then we'll run some rules gamuts and it'll be all over and you'll get to vote and you'll win by, you know, there won't be a single Democrat that votes for you, maybe. I mean, who knows what happens in some of these close uh, midterm elections, Montana, who, you know, Tester may vote for him, who knows. But if it's not, and Schumer's serious about filibustering this, uh, I think Mon McConnell goes to the nuclear option and... Uh, does away with the filibuster. But I, I think it would be a mistake for Democrats, following on what I said, I think it would be a big mistake Yeah, I agree. for, for no Democrats to vote for this nominee. Right. Uh, I covered Lindsey Graham closely for our South Carolina papers. He voted for, um, uh, uh, for both of President Obama's uh, nominees. And he said, look, that you get that right as president to choose. As long as they're not, as long as they're not beyond the pale, that's the right they get by being elected. Yeah, indeed. And uh, it's time now to take some questions from our viewers. And we start with Edith Haynes, who says, do nominees for lower courts dodge questions the same way SCOTUS nominees do, Supreme Court nominees? The thing is, he didn't dodge questions. He answered them the exact same way that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg answered. And in fact, they're not supposed to give. If you're asked a question, how would you rule on right. this case? That's a hypothetical. If he did answer it, it's a gotcha. Oh, well then, we, right. why, why should we vote for you? you already, you've already made up your mind. You're not a real, a real judge. Um, I don't think that there are some aspects of hearings that are involved. Usually these are just an up and down vote when the president appoints an appellate court level or somebody like that. But um, I think he, he answered the questions perfectly and answered them as in, in the tradition of what most uh, Supreme Court nominees have. I, I, I want to just add that I've been covering Washington for 22 and a half years. I've rarely seen somebody testify before Congress of any ilk, left, right, center, uh, businessman, politician, uh, nonprofit crew, who didn't dodge questions. I mean, I mean it, it's not in their interest to answer every the question. The other thing is that's why at the, at the, uh, uh, the State of the Union, the judges never nod. They're not supposed to or show any expression because they're supposed to be nonpolitical. Right. Okay. And uh, our second question <clears throat> comes from Neil Boyd, and it's also on the Supreme Court nomination, and perhaps we can have a little sweepstake here, because <laughs> the question is, how many Democrats will vote to confirm Gorsuch? Kelly, what do you think? I, I, I don't know. Um, I know they need eight votes, I believe, um, to pass him, the, to uh, over, overcome the filibuster. I don't know. I, I'm sorry, but... Make a guess. Make a guess. <laughs> yes, it's a sweepstake. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I would say six, maybe six would. I think if the Democrats are smart, they'll get they'll give the eight votes. Uh, it, it, we're seeing both parties make dumb mistakes these days, so uh, I don't. So you know, how many I, are you going for? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I think Democrats in the end will they'll they'll make they'll they'll jump up and down, they'll filibuster, they'll yell. I agree a bit with Leaf here. I think the scenario about the kabuki dance, and I think in the end, uh, at least eight will vote for him. Got a number? Uh, yeah, uh, three. Three. Ooh. They're going to turn. They'll turn everybody loose after they do their little dance, and I think the th there, there'll be there's at least three Democrats. I think Tester, um, uh, Manchin, uh, Manchin in, in West Virginia, and um, I, I think who else is one of the more conservatives? Uh, it'll be one other one. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, people like McCaskill, who's down by eight points right now, it, it, she'll she'll still vote no because. In her heart, I think she 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 wants this wasn't the Supreme Court nominee we were supposed to have. Okay. Yeah. And now it's time for our most underreported stories of the week. And James Rosen, last time we were here together, I had to cut you <laughs> off at the end, so we'll start with you. Um, in all this other tumult about spies and Russia and Mr. Gorsuch, Judge Gorsuch, and and so forth, it's been a little bit lost that uh, President Trump uh, had a had a success. I wrote about it. Um, 
uh, his second nominee for uh, Secretary of Labor, Alexandra Acosta, who's from South Florida, I write for, a lot for the Miami Herald, uh, testified before the Senate Labor uh, Committee yesterday. And although he was uh, asked a few tough questions about some controversial elements of his past, he performed very ably. He's got some. He's already got some Democratic supporters publicly. He's got most significantly several major unions out in support of him. This is all in sharp contrast with Mr. Uh, Mr. Puzder, the first nominee who was an extremist, anti-worker, had a rec long record of that and had some personal controversies. So I think he's, uh, I think Mr. Acosta is on his way uh, to being confirmed. And he, if so, he would be the first Hispanic member of President Trump's cabinet. Uh, I'm gonna fall back on what I said earlier in regards to the, uh, uh, the ongoing investigation. The most underreported story was was mentioned by Bob Woodward, and I said it. Obama people in the intelligence community who were who were there uh, under his administration will be indicted for violations of the intelligence community rules by relief, by opening up and revealing Americans' names who were captured inadvertently in the monitoring of uh, foreign diplomats. So on that point, just quickly, the unmasking is or can be lawful yeah. if. It's if there's a genuine intelligence concern there, correct, so yeah. isn't that the issue? Perhaps for well, if we had a genuine concern, then people would have been in, there. Would have been the FBI would have gone for indictments already. Just to un un unveiling that that, uh, uh, that that Mr. Flynn was talking to the Russian diplomat to the Russian ambassador, and there's no proof that he was doing anything illegal. That's where the violation occurred, and had in and, and the same things with Roger Stone and other folks like that. Okay, and Kayla, you're well, under a Well, I, I know I have like two seconds, <laughs> um, but uh, Fat Leonard, the huge scandal um, sweeping the Navy right now. Um, it's not underreported. The Washington Post has been all over this, but we're talking about um, numerous members of the uh, the Navy community, including 30 <clears throat> admirals, are under investigation for taking. Uh, bribes yeah. from this one defense contractor who is bilking the, the Navy billions, billions or millions of dollars. Um, and <laughs> billions, we're seeing, you, you were right. Billions. Yeah, we're seeing that unfold right now, and it's just uh, a sad state of affairs. Um, but, you know, I don't see a lot of attention being given to it right now. Yeah, it's sad, sad. Is there a surprise in defense contracting that there's uh, bribery going on? Like, like Howard, like Howard Hughes says, you, you, you know, you, you show me a different way of doing it to win these contracts, then and not everybody else is doing it, then I'll do it the same, the different way. So, all right. Well, that's all from us for this week. I'm Adam Beer. Thanks for watching the Square Circle. We'll see you next week. have a passion for helping people, want to launch a new charity, or need to raise funds, Voluntary Solutions can help. You have a passion for helping people. We have a passion for helping you. Visit VoluntarySolutionsDC.com, 844-739-5488.